So we, it won't come as a surprise uh, to any of you to hear me say that we're living through uh, really great events. Our lives are going to be defined by upheaval, war and revolution from the environment, the economy, uh, healthcare, education, politics, international relations. There's, there's crisis at every level of society. The old world is dying on its feet. But in almost every country around the world, you can see a new world struggling to be born. Uh, and mass movements, sometimes through the ballot box, uh, or through demonstrations, or strikes, or even revolutions, have rippled around the world over the last 10 years. The role of the Revolutionary Party is to bring together all of those who don't just want to be spectators in that process, but people bring together those who want to intervene in that process, to solve the problems which are causing all of these crises in the first place, which are giving rise to these mass movements. In that sense, the Revolutionary Party is the midwife to the birth of the new world. Um, <clears throat> now, the construction of such a party has been attempted many times throughout history. And we, that is Socialist Appeal and the International Marxist Tendency, are attempting to do the same thing again today. Uh, so we're quite interested in the attempts of the past, what worked and what didn't. The starting point is having a clear picture of what it is that we are trying to build. What is this party for? It is not an end in itself. It's a tool to end capitalism and to put power in the hands of the working class definitively and irreversibly. It's a weapon to fight for what Marx called the dictatorship of the proletariat. That is the role of a revolutionary party. The dictatorship of the proletariat, that is the dictatorship of the vast majority of people, the masses, over the tiny minority of those who currently occupy the position of the ruling class. And, and the dictatorship of the proletariat is to suppress the rights that that tiny minority currently claim, which is the right to exploit and hoard and plunder the planet uh, and, uh, and degrade the lives of the rest of us. That's the dictatorship of the proletariat. That is the role of the Revolutionary Party. It's to establish that. There are plenty of social democratic parties or other groupings of a left coloration um, which seek to kind of rebalance things, work within co in the confines of the system and rebalance things a little bit more in favor of the workers. Organizations like Momentum go no further than this, and they are not they're not trying to build a revolutionary party. Other uh, left groups do even less than that. They confine themselves to a uh, little more than charity efforts, food banks and that sort of thing, to alleviate some of the worst effects of capitalism without attacking their root cause. And such groups propose to do this by compromising or persuading the capitalist class. And the advocates of reformism of this kind can be found throughout academia, throughout the labor movement, and these ideas hold a lot of sway over a lot of people. They are very prevalent ideas. We've all come across them, I'm sure. To combat the enormous pressure of reformism that exists in capitalist and bourgeois society, revolutionaries have to weld themselves together into a party with an independent program for socialist revolution to resist that pressure that is coming from elsewhere. If we're on our own, we don't, with, those, with our revolutionary ideas, we don't stand much of a chance. We have to weld ourselves together into a revolutionary party. Because without a clearly delineated revolutionary party, our aim, that is to overthrow capitalism and put power in the hands of the workers, can end up submerged in this swamp of reformism. I'll give you an example. In February 1917, the Russian masses overthrew the Tsar. And what replaced him was a system of dual power. The workers and the peasants expressed themselves through Soviets, councils, workers' councils, to which they elected their representatives. Meanwhile, the formal government was a bourgeois liberal one known as the provisional government under the leadership of Alexander Kerensky. And both of those sources of power, representing different class interests, existed side by side. The provisional government, representing the interests of the Russian capitalists and foreign imperialists, was forced into this kind of uneasy accommodation with the Soviets, who were representing the interests of the exploited masses. This is what replaced the Tsar in February 1917. Now, Stalin and Kamenev, at that time, occupied leading positions in the Bolshevik party. Lenin was in exile abroad. And Stalin and Kamenev declared the Bolshevik position to be one of support, conditional support, but support for the provisional government, for the bourgeois government. 
Now, Stalin and Kamen have got, got carried away, basically, by the euphoria of the situation of the February Revolution. And you can imagine it, masses in the streets, overthrow of the Tsar, something that they've been fighting for for ages. And they say, we'll support the provisional government in and so far as it defends the interests of the workers, which, of course, was in no way whatsoever. What, what Stalin and Kamenev did, they lost sight of the irreconcilability of exploiter and exploited, the provisional government and the Soviets, of bourgeois and proletarian. They advocated class collaboration in that situation. But such unity obviously is impossible. There are irreconcilable antagonisms that cannot be smoothed over. And one side or the other will get the upper hand sooner or later and press home its advantage. The role of a revolutionary party is not to advocate unity between boss and worker, but for the overthrow of the bosses and all power to the workers. And sure enough, when Lenin returned from exile in April 1917, he came out very hard against Stalin and Kamenev's line. His slogan was, all power to the Soviets. And that is the revolutionary line. All power to the working class, overthrow the bourgeois government and the capitalist class they represent. Lenin reorientated to the Bolsheviks, and that's how they conquered power for the workers and overthrew capitalism. That remorseless battle against reformism, compromise, and class collaboration, that is the essence of a revolutionary party. Where parties have failed to adopt that remorseless irreconcilability, they have not been able to play a revolutionary role. During the Hungarian Revolution of 1919, the Communist Party succumbed to the pressure of the reformist Social Democratic Party. And they dissolved themselves effectively into a government, a joint government with the Social Democrats, with the, with the left reformists, basically, in a revolutionary situation. The Communist Party saw this as a shortcut. The Communist Party leaders saw this as a shortcut to building the Communist Party in Hungary at that time. We'll go into government with the left reformists, and that will that will help us establish our authority a bit more. They thought, and they thought that would allow them to connect a bit more with the masses. In fact, it was an attempt to unify what was fundamentally those who wanted to overthrow capitalism with those who wanted to preserve capitalism. Yeah, in a, in a different form, in a in a more palatable form, but nevertheless, they wanted to preserve capitalism. And the result was a government that vacillated uh, between uh, centrism, between, between uh, maintaining capitalism, reforming capitalism, and wanting to overthrow it. It vacillated, and it ended up ultimately uh, betraying the working class in the interests of that revolution. And those betrayals the communists were forced to take responsibility for because they had dissolved themselves into that government with the Social Democrats. And that led to all sorts of confusion then among the ranks of the communists, among the working uh, class in Hungary at the time. And that, uh, that confusion turned to demoralization, which turned to defeat of the revolution and the communist party. In 1926, there was a general strike in Britain. And the communist party leaders at that time told workers to put all of their faith in the left trade union leaders. And that also was another attempt at unity between those who wanted to end capitalism, and those left trade union leaders who just wanted a slightly nice version of capitalism. They had no interest, no intention of ever actually overthrowing capitalism. The general strike was an opportunity to do so. The left trade union leaders had no intention of taking that opportunity. But the Communist Party leaders said, we should all put our faith in the left trade union leaders. And the result was the betrayal of the general strike by those very same left trade union leaders. Um, <clears throat> leading to all sorts of confusion, inevitably, about why the Communist Party leaders had said that we should put all of our faith in the trade union leaders. And that led to enormous demoralization and enormous undermining of the support of the Communist Party as a result. During the Spanish Revolution in the 1930s, there was a party called the PUM, P-O-U-M, whose aim, whose aim was the overthrow of capitalism. But in that revolutionary process, they entered into all sorts of electoral pacts with bourgeois liberal parties. They participated in governments which attacked workers' councils uh, and supported the kind of liberal anarchists at different points. And they did say, they said, because we're too small to influence things in, in, in any other way. A bit like the leaders of the Hungarian Com Communist Party. Well, we need to find a way to connect with the masses. We're too small to influence things otherwise. But it remained small precisely because it didn't counterpose itself sharply to the actions of those who were unwilling to break with capitalism. All those people they participated with never had any intention of breaking with capitalism. And by refusing to counterpose themselves to that, 
were refusing to adopt this line, all power to the workers, all power to the Soviets. They, uh, they, they never managed to conquer uh, the, the, the mass support that they required. In each of those cases that I've outlined, the party failed to wage a remorseless, uncompromising struggle against reformism and against class collaboration. They gave in to the pressures of the moment. The Hungarians gave in to the pressures of the social democracy at that time. Um, <clears throat> And the, uh, the, 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 British gave, the British Communist Party leaders gave in to the pressures of the left trade union leaders. They gave in to the pressures of the moment and lost sight of the fundamental role of a revolutionary party, which is to put power in the hands of the working class definitively and irreversibly. And the result in each case was the defeat of the revolutionary movement. So that is our starting point. We're building a party that will fight remorselessly for the dictatorship of the proletariat and nothing less. How do you get people to fight remorselessly for something and to fight for it effectively? Because look, it's not like Stalin and Kamenev, for example, were not willing to fight in general. Of course they were. The Hungarian and British Communist Party leaders had all been to prison for their, uh, for their views, their beliefs, their ideas. The leaders of the Poom were fighting a civil war at the time. These people were, were willing to fight. They just didn't know how to do it effectively. The only way to convince people to fight remorselessly for something is to educate them. It's to study the way the world works, the way capitalism works, the laws of the class struggle, and the revolutionary process. In other words, it's to prove, in theory and in practice, why the dictatorship of the proletariat is the only thing that can solve the problems of today, and why certain methods will bring that dictatorship closer and other methods will push it further away. If people are genuinely educated, genuinely convinced of those ideas, they will fight for them. That's the only way you get people to fight, is to convince them properly of doing so. Now, Lenin and Trotsky, obviously, they understood the development of capitalism in Russia very well. They wrote books like Imperialism, The Permanent Revolution, about that. They understood the impact that that development was going to have on the class struggle in Russia. They analyzed the 1905 revolution, uh, on that basis, they fought also to prove the correctness of a revolutionary world outlook against those who wanted to water down Marxist ideas with their writings on the state, for example, state and revolution, materialism and imperial criticism on Marxist philosophy. In other words, they, they put the effort in to educating themselves and the people around them, convincing them through, through theory and through practice that these are the only ideas that are correct, that can actually explain the world and that can actually offer a way forward. That kind of political education is the bedrock on which a revolutionary party is built. Because that is the only way that any of us will be able to navigate the twists and turns and the pressures of a revolutionary situation. We need to be able to see, the revolutionary party needs to be able to see clearly, with a clear perspective, um, not to be blown off course, not to get caught up in the moment without understanding its significance, what it represents, and where it's going from here. Basically, to be the Lenin among the Stalin and the Kamenevs. That's what we need to construct. And to do that, we need a very thorough and deep political education. Now, I, I first got involved in politics at university in 2010, which is when the tuition fees were being tripled. I got involved with that movement. Uh, so I actually started off as an anarchist, but got quite sick of them, uh, as you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> at the time, Marxism as an organized force among students was extremely weak uh, and far more dominant. Were these kind of, it's a bit much to call them anarchists. They had no real understanding of anarchism, but they were these kind of anti-cuts groups, general kind of activist uh, groups, mainly loose networks of activists, basically. They were the, they were the dominant uh, groups in universities at that time. And those student activist groups did a lot. They organized demonstrations. They ran occupations up and down the country throughout this movement. But they were extremely skeptical, and I would say even contemptuous, of political theory and education. To the extent that they did do it, to the extent they put on kind of political discussions in the occupations and stuff like that, it was purely a navel-gazing academic exercise, as opposed to political education that could be a serious guide to uh, action. Their approach in general, I would say, was, we don't, why do we need to waste time 
having these kind of uh, discussions, we need to go and get things done. We need, to go and, we, can, we need to go and be active. We need to go and do things. Today, none of those activist organizations are st still exist from 10 years ago. Not a single one uh, is still around. Of all the people that I was involved with at that time, almost none of them are still involved in politics in any way. Um, <clears throat> Because they have been thrown over the last 10 years, and there's a lot gone on in the last 10 years uh, from well, all sorts. I don't need to go through it, but Corbyn, obviously Scottish independence and all of that movement, various uh, economic crises, uh, Brexit, all this kind of thing. All these people have been thrown from pillar to post by those events. No understanding whatsoever of what is going on. No long-term perspective. No understanding of the state. No understanding of the national question. Uh, no understanding of the Labour Party and, and trade unions and how the class struggle moves or anything like this because all they were interested in was, oh, we just got to get things done. Never mind talking about those things. Let's just go and get stuff done. The result is none of them are still uh, active. The only organisation that still exists from 10 years ago is the Marxist Student Federation, which is the, the student wing of the IMT in Britain. And that is the only, and the reason is that's the only organisation that has taken a serious approach to uh, political education. It's thanks to that that we've been able, and if I'd still been involved, we've been able to navigate the last 10 years. If I had stayed involved with those anarchists, there's no way I would still be involved in politics. That's the point. It's because I got involved with the Marxists that I've been able to, to navigate, along with, with everybody else in social school and the IMT, uh, the last 10 years of twists and turns to orientate people to explain events. Not only does the Marxist Student Federation still exist, it's roughly five times the size that it was back then. I'm not equating what we have done to the building of the Bolshevik Party. There's a long way to go yet. But the point is you can see the kind of methods that get results as opposed to those which don't. The Revolutionary Party then, in, its, in the process of its construction, is what we would call a CADA organization. Now, a CADA is a military term, meaning a small group of people organized and trained to be able to lead and train others. And the party needs to be, the Revolutionary Party needs to be made up of revolutionary cadres who have a full and deep understanding of the world and the revolutionary process, who can distill that understanding into a program for action, and who can convince people of that program and win a leading position for revolutionary ideas in the movement that they are intervening in. Without cadres, you cannot build a revolutionary party. When the British Communist Party was founded in 1920, uh, it was composed of, I would say, some of the best, the most radical, the most talented workers and trade unionists at that time. It was small, but it was really the cream of the cream uh, from, from that point of view. But it always suffered from a lack of a serious approach to political education. The British Communists relied very heavily on political guidance from the Communist International. And the result was that as the Comintern degenerated and was Stalinized, um, the British Communists par participated very little in those debates that were taking place about the future direction of the Soviet Union, the debates between Stalin and Trotsky. So the British Communists didn't really participate. And actually, the Stalin for that reason, Stalin described the British Communist Party as a model party because they just shut up and did what they were told. Uh, but they didn't really participate in these debates. They simply followed instructions from the international rather than think for themselves. They were great activists, they were incredible trade unionists and the rest of it, but they didn't have that political education and that political development. And that lack of political education led to that debacle in 1926 with the general strike that I mentioned earlier, with, the, with this just say, oh, just rely on the left trade union leaders and that will sort us out, when of course uh, it didn't. And likewise, when, when Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht were assassinated during the German Revolution in 1919, the German Communist Party really was beheaded. Aside from Luxembourg, there was no one really in that party with a high political level, a high level of political understanding, who could guide uh, the German Communists through the turbulence of the revolutionary situation at that time. And so they started getting thrown from pillar to post and making all sorts of mistakes because they couldn't develop an understanding of the process and what was happening. Now, cadres don't drop from the sky. Um, <clears throat> There are many who believe that a revolutionary organization can be improvised in the heat of the moment, in the heat of the revolutionary situation. But training professional revolutionaries, that's what cadres are, they're professional revolutionaries. Training professional revolutionaries takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. The Bolshevik Party was formed over decades. 
Lenin and Trotsky, the, the Lenin and Trotsky who led the workers to power in 1917, didn't drop from the sky. They, they, they were the product, and their ideas and their methods and their approach was the product of decades, of years spent studying, analyzing, debating, discussing, participating, struggling through the ebbs and flows of the class struggle. And without those years of preparation, the Bolsheviks would not have had the cadres for the Revolutionary Party, which led the workers to power in 1917. Now, by contrast, the Hungarians, the Hungarian Communist Party, was formed in November 1918 and was in power by March 1919. The German Revolution began in November 1918. The German Communist Party was formed in December 1918, after the revolution had started. No wonder those parties were not able to play the revolutionary role that was required of them because they hadn't had the time to train and educate the cadres. There is no shortcut to that, and it cannot be improvised in the heat of the moment. In terms of shortcuts, we, what we need is people who, can, who are educated, convinced of the ideas, and trained and practiced in the class struggle. Now, Gregory Zinoviev was a, was a Bolshevik, and he was head of the Communist International, the international kind of umbrella organization for all the communist parties around the world. He was head of that from 1919 to 1926. And his job was essentially to train cadres to lead the communist parties in all different countries around the world. He was supposed to train up the leaderships, basically. But his methods were the exact opposite of what is required to train cadres and build a revolutionary party. He dealt with political problems in an entirely organizational way. Instead of discussing things out politically, he, he dealt with political problems by yeah, looking for shortcuts. Instead of patiently convincing people through political discussion, he resorted to threats when people disagreed with him, intimidation, suspensions, expulsions, securing blind obedience, in other words. Not convincing people and getting them and welding together a party of people who are all convinced together, but just uh, dictating to them, basically, and kicking them out and threatening them if they didn't agree with him. He demanded loyalty to himself and, uh, and, and, and later to Stalin as an individual or a clique above political principles. He based himself on personal prestige instead of political ability. Those kind of methods are absolute poison to a revolutionary party, and they were poison to all of the parties of the Communist International that Zinoviev infected with those methods. Those methods don't educate people, they avoid serious political discussion, and therefore weaken the political understanding and the resolve and the conviction of a revolutionary organization. And that rot has seeped down through generations, subsequent generations of political activists. A man called James P. Cannon, he introduced those kind of methods into the American uh, Trotskyist movement and to the Fourth International as a whole after Trotsky's death in 1940. And actually, it was these kind of methods also which resulted in the collapse of Militant, which was the biggest revolutionary organization ever built in Britain, which collapsed in the early 90s. During the second half of the 1980s, Militant's education department was closed down. Political discussion was replaced by just blind activism, orders were issued from a clique at the top, and those who raised criticisms were expelled. And that led to the decline and the degeneration of that organization. Because you cannot hold a revolutionary party together with those kind of methods. It can only be done by convincing people of your ideas. History shows us then that without cadres, there is no revolutionary party. Think back to what Alan Wood said yesterday, without revolutionary theory, there is no revolutionary movement. So uncompromising revolutionary aims and a solid cadre base are the fundamentals of building a revolutionary party. But a clear understanding of Marxist ideas on their own and in the abstract is not good enough. The revolutionary party also needs to be able to connect those ideas with reality. It needs a program to take those ideas to the masses. And the history of the Bolshevik Party contains episodes where the program has been very well thought out and well executed, and others where it has not. During the 1905 revolution in Russia, the, the masses, the working masses, created of their own initiative uh, workers' councils, the Soviets. And these were mass organizations representing the will of, uh, the mass, of the revolutionary masses. Now, the Russian Marxists at that time, very small, very inexperienced, 
also lacking Lenin's guidance, he was abroad at this time, they actually viewed the Soviets with hostility. Um, <clears throat> because they said, well, they're not, they're not Marxist organizations with a, a chemically pure Marxist program. And so they sent a delegation to the St. Petersburg Soviet, for example, with an ultimatum. They said, uh, either the Soviet accepts the Marxist program or it disbands itself immediately. And obviously the, re the masses, the revolutionary masses, looked at this tiny little group of Marxists uh, who were making these kind of furious, angry demands at them and just shrugged their shoulders and, and said, all right, you, you guys crack on. And they walked out and the Soviet carried on with its business because it was the mass organization. This tiny little group said, accept our demands or we're leaving. And so they said, all right, off you go then. Um, <clears throat> Lenin, obviously, when he learned about this kind of sectarian, this is pure sectarianism. And uh, when he learned about this, he was really tearing his hair out. That is not a serious program for taking revolutionary ideas to the masses. It doesn't put forward serious demands. It doesn't have a strategy for action. It's just shouting from the sidelines, basically. And without that, without a serious strategy, without, a, without demands and a program for action, you cannot win over the masses, of course. All you do with that kind of behavior is cut yourself off from the movement. Now in 1917, a few years later, the Bolsheviks took a different approach. During that revolution, they participated energetically in the Soviets. Even though at the beginning of 1917, they were in a minority. The Mensheviks had control of the Soviets at that time. But the Bolsheviks didn't turn up and say, you Mensheviks accept our, our position or we're leaving. They participated as a minority. And and spent the whole year, basically, patiently explaining their ideas and advancing a program in the Soviets which implacably defended the need for a dictatorship of the proletariat and seizing every opportunity to partially advance their aims, win any victories they can, to win more people over, basically. Now, the methods of 1905, as I said, resulted in Marxism being cut off from the revolutionary movement, but the methods of 1917 resulted in the Marxists winning leadership of the Soviets and of the revolutionary masses and conquering power. Now, in 1921, the German Communist Party, which, of course, was still very inexperienced at this point and lacking in cadres, uh, Zinoviev was head of the Comintern, and true to form, he was looking for a shortcut in, uh, to, to revolution in Germany. He, didn't, he couldn't be bothered with the patient training and, uh, and uh, education of cadres. So in 1921, he encouraged the communists to an armed uprising. Uh, he said, you should just have an uprising and then demand that the masses follow you in this armed uprising, basically. Um, and this, is, this was known at the time as a theory of the offensive, and it was put into practice in March 1921. It was a grotesque misreading of the mood of the masses. The workers did not follow the communists into battle. The communists launched these armed themselves and launched these insurrections, and the masses, a bit like the Soviets in 1905, just looked at these communists and thought, well, we're not really, not really into that at the moment, to be honest. And, uh, and that march, that infamous march action, 1921, it resulted in hundreds of deaths, thousands of people imprisoned. The action, in fact, widened the split between the communists and ordinary workers who were still at that time unconvinced of the need for an armed insurrection. And within a short time, 200,000 members of the German Communist Party had left that party in disgust at that theory of the offensive at the March action. Because a revolutionary party obviously doesn't just demand armed insurrection at every possible opportunity irrelevant of the circumstances. It learns to understand the situation and the mood of the masses and tailor its tactics and its slogans according to that. And after the March action of 1921, Lenin initiated a discussion throughout the Comintern about ultra-leftism, about, about tactics to correct these mistakes that were being made, not just in Germany, but in one country after another, about how you take Marxist ideas and connect them with the existing mood of the masses. And the documents of the Third Congress of the Communist International, uh, which was held in 1921, are very helpful and are worth reading uh, for formulating revolutionary tactics today. Now, unfortunately, there aren't many organizations today which pay attention to these lessons from the past. Last month in Myanmar, there was this self-proclaimed interim national unity government. There's, there's lots of protests. I don't know if you've been following what's going on in Myanmar, but there's been lots of protests, basically. Um, and this kind of self-proclaimed national unity government called for an armed insurrection online. They just said, right, it's time for an armed insurrection. Everyone arm themselves, and off we go. We're going to overthrow the military junta. 
But it was, it was all the way back in February and March of this year that the workers were on the streets, really struggling, fighting with the police and all the rest of it. Uh, that was several months ago. Since then, the movement has ebbed a lot. An armed struggle cannot be launched at this point when the movement is in an ebb. An attempt to do so would be pure adventurism. So to make that kind of call, it has real echoes of the March action of 1921. Uh, and, and we've got to remember all the, all the terrible consequences that came from that. Those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, and many of those organizations that claim to be revolutionary organizations today have not learned anything from the history of the revolutionary movement up until this point. I'd say the early years of the Communist Party of Great Britain are an example of how, they are actually a very good example of how a revolutionary party can effectively transmit its ideas to the workers' movement with a serious program. The Communist Party at that time, I'm, talk, I'm talking early 1920s in Britain, developed a series of very good demands, not just shrill denunciations of everyone who, did, who didn't agree with them, but positive demands for the movement to take up. So they, they demanded that the Trade Union Congress be organized as a proper parliament of workers with the slogan of back to the unions. Um, they began to revive local trades councils as local coordinating groups for the class struggle, and that was a very successful campaign. They established something called the National Minority Movement within the trade unions. And that was a kind of organization that fought to bring together all the rank and file of the trade unions to fight for uh, industri like in industrial struggles, basically. And, uh, and that was also extremely successful. August 1924, they had a huge conference of the National Minority Movement. 200,000 uh, workers were represented there. And the demands coming out of that conference were an extension of the Communist Party's demands at that time, including the setting up of factory committees, developing trades councils as coordinating centers for working class action. And, uh, and they were talking about general strike, strengthening the, 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 trade, the TUC general council in preparation for a general strike. They envisaged, ultimately, the development of the class struggle um, and, uh, and, and using the, any, uh, the national minority movement to raise the sight of the working class towards ideas that would, uh, towards the idea, basically, that change within capitalism was utopian. If we want to fight these industrial battles and win them and win the rights of workers, actually, it's a, it's a more fundamental question, not just an industrial question or an economic question, it's a political question of what kind of system we have. And they wanted, they were using the, the national minority movement to raise, to intervene in the strikes that were actually taking place, bring these workers together and issue demands that raise that kind of perspective. The, the Communist Party's industrial work in that sense had a political character. Now, those, uh, that, that is what allowed them to connect throughout 1924 with the uptick in industrial action that was taking place in Britain at that time. It was a serious program, a strategy for action that had a political content and a political character to it. That's how you build a revolutionary party. As I say, 1926, it all went down the pan and it was wrecked by the Stalinization of the Comintern. But that bit of the national minority movement, that bit of, of the history of the British Communist Party, uh, is a great example and a great lesson to us. That's how you build. You take Marxist ideas, you connect them with the living struggle of the working class. You aim to build a bridge between the immediate demands, the partial demands of the moment, of the struggles of the moment, and the overall goal of overthrowing capitalism, which is the root cause of the problems that we face that are giving rise to these struggles. That is the revolutionary program, and the revolutionary program, Trotsky said, is the essence of the revolutionary party. Now, developing such a program, as I mentioned before, it requires deep roots in the masses. The party needs to be able to read the mood and the consciousness of workers at any given moment in order to successfully uh, link up with it to fight for, link, link those demands and the consciousness with the fight for socialism. And for that, it needs to, the party needs to unite all the most advanced elements of the workers' movement under its banner, under one banner, to coordinate all the different struggles, and link the various partial demands, the, part, the parts of the class struggle, to the whole fight against capitalism. One of, the failures, one of the reasons for the failure of the 1905 revolution in Russia was that different layers of the working class moved at different times. So first of all, in that period, you had the vanguard move in, in Petersburg. Um, <clears throat> and so there was this big movement in St. Petersburg, which was then pushed back. After that, after, as the movement in Petersburg began to ebb, the workers in Moscow began to move. And they called on the workers in Petersburg to join them in their struggle. But obviously, the movements were moving at, different pa at a different pace. And the, and the workers in St. Petersburg were in a bit of an ebb. 
they've been pushed back, they've been defeated, and, uh, and so weren't in the right place, weren't in the right mood, the right consciousness to join the workers in Moscow. And uh, after the Moscow movement was pushed back and defeated, strikes continued into 90, on, on into 1906, but these were effectively rearguard skirmishes. The main battle had been lost because you had this dislocation between all these different elements of the, these different layers of the working class. Now in 1917, a similar situation arose actually. In July, the soldiers and the workers in Petrograd were exasperated with the vacillating of the Menshevik leaders of the Soviets. And, and they spilled onto the streets. There was a demonstration of half a million in July 1917 in St. Petersburg, demanding the overthrow of the provisional government. Now, the Bolsheviks at that time were a lot stronger than they had been in 1905. They were able to influence events a little bit. And they understood that the Petrograd workers at that point were ahead of the rest of the country. And they had learned the lesson from 1905. And, uh, and, if they and they understood if they moved, if in Petrograd they moved to seize power now, they would be cut off uh, from the rest of the working class, isolated and defeated before everybody else was ready to move. So the Bolsheviks participated in those demonstrations with the aim of holding them back, with the aim of saying, wait a minute, we've got to let everybody else catch up, we've got to let everybody else get into the right position for this movement. That is also the role of a revolutionary party. It's to bring into one party all the localized and partial struggles and weld them together into a weapon which can strike as one at the root cause of all of the problems. During the Egyptian revolution of 2011 to 13, the absence of a party that could do that was extremely clear. During those years, there was probably not a single factory or institution or workplace that didn't have some kind of act of disobedience against uh, the ruling class. There were hundreds of demonstrations and protests by workers and students, mass strikes taking place and so on. And these things were all loosely connected, obviously, but not bound together as part of a single coordinated effort to bring down capitalism in Egypt. If those strikers, for example, from the industrial city of Mahala and, and the youth who were occupying Tahrir Square and all the other elements in the front rank of that revolution, if they could have been welded together under the same banner of uncompromising struggle for power to be put into the hands of the working class, we would be talking about a socialist Egypt today, but the Revolutionary Party, with roots in the masses and the program to unite all those advanced elements, didn't exist, and the revolution went down to defeat. Now, the Revolutionary Party, as this, as this vehicle for Marxist ideas in the workers' movement, is also a practical thing. And it is also the role of revolutionaries to do the thousand and one small tasks that go into building that vehicle. It's not all giving grand speeches from the top of barricades. Uh, there's lots of small tasks that go into building a, a vehicle for socialist revolution. In 1901, Lenin was trying to professionalize the revolutionary movement in Russia and weld it together as this serious vehicle for Marxist ideas among the workers. And he argued, one of the key things that he argued at that point was the need for a newspaper. Not just, he said, not just to get the ideas out there, although that was important too, but uh, as a tool around which the party could organize itself. He linked, he likened the newspaper to scaffolding around a building, um, a building under construction. He said the paper is effectively that. He, he, it would, he said, he, he said it would bring uh, systematic planning, preparation, regularity, professionalism, in other words, to the work of the Marxists. And at that time, it was a real polemic. He faced stiff opposition from those who basically preferred the revolutionary movement to be a kind of vague, loose discussion club or an activist group of people who just dipped their toe in from time to time whenever they fancied it uh, and didn't want the kind of professional outfit with a, with a regularity that the production of a paper brings. Um, eventually, Lenin's position won out, of course, and the revolutionary newspaper became a key plank in the building of the Bolshevik party. The building of a revolutionary party also requires funds to produce literature, to meet other expenses, and so on. And that need increases as revolutionary events develop. In 1901 and 1902, the budget of the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks together was just a few hundred rubles. But in 1905, in the heat of a revolutionary movement in Russia, the budget had grown to tens of thousands of rubles uh, a year. And how that money is raised is an important one for the revolutionary party. The, the Baku Committee of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party was Menshevik-dominated. 
And, uh, and they received just, in 1905, they received, the Baku Committee received 3% of all of its donations from workers. The rest were large individual donations from wealthy sympathizers. 3% from workers, the rest from wealthy sympathizers. And by contrast, in the Bolshevik stronghold of Ivanovo Voznesk, apologies for pronunciation, the figure there, though, was 53% uh, from workers. Uh, and the rest from individual donations. And, uh, <clears throat> and that was the product of a conscious effort on the part of the Bolsheviks to base themselves on the pennies and the small donations of the workers, because that provides political independence for the Revolutionary Party from those wealthy individuals. If they hold the purse strings, then they can dictate the, the political line. And the Revolutionary Party can never allow itself to be in that kind of position. We have to learn from that method today as well. Things like the newspaper or fundraising or any, any one of the kind of thousand and one small little tasks that go into building a revolutionary organization. It's those kind of things. It's not the grand speeches from the barricades. It's those kind of tasks, which is how revolutionaries are formed. In the 1930s, Trotsky was trying to build the Fourth International under heavy fire from Stalin on all fronts. Progress was very slow, conditions very difficult. And Trotsky's writings from that time are all about those thousand and one little tasks. Well, not all of them. There's a lot, though, about those thousand and one little tasks. About the need for a meticulous attention to detail. About the need for good bookkeeping. The need for determination and sacrifice of time and money. In 1929, he wrote the following. He said, comrades who are capable of initiative and personal sacrifice are revolutionaries or can become such. Because it is in this way that revolutionaries are formed. You can have revolutionaries, both wise and ignorant, intelligent or mediocre. But you can't have revolutionaries who lack the willingness to smash obstacles, who lack devotion and the spirit of sacrifice. This is the practical side of building a revolutionary party. And we should remember that while we study and discuss and debate Marxist ideas, the point is not just to interpret the world, but to change it. And we are building a weapon with which we can overthrow capitalism. We are not building a discussion club. It's a weapon to overthrow capitalism. And that requires centralism. It requires discipline. It requires self-sacrifice also. I'll quote again from Trotsky, 1929 again. He said the following. He said, there are those for whom socialism is a side issue, a second-class occupation accommodated to their leisure hours. These are class enemies. We must steer our course on those proletarians for whom the idea of communism becomes their whole life and activity. There is nothing more disgusting and dangerous. This is still Trotsky, by the way, not me. There is nothing more disgusting, although I agree with it. <laughs> there is nothing more disgusting and dangerous in revolutionary activity than petty bourgeois dilettantism conservative, egotistical, self-loving, and incapable of sacrifice in the name of a great idea. Those who in peaceful everyday times are incapable of sacrificing their time, their strength, their means to the cause of communism, will oftenest of all in a revolutionary period become direct traitors. That is advice to every single one of us. We are not playing games with what we're trying to build here. The building of a revolutionary party is not the subject of a nice discussion for a Sunday afternoon. It is, as Trotsky says, the whole content of our life and our activity. And that means we have to draw certain conclusions on a personal level about what it is to build a revolutionary party. And I invite you all here to seriously think about what that requires of each of us. What we're building today is, a, is, a is an international revolutionary party, which stands in the tradition of the first international of Marx and Engels, known as the International Working Men's Association. That revolutionary party was an international not for sentimental reasons, but because capitalism is international. The struggle of workers around the world obviously has no borders. Um, <clears throat> all of those struggles are partial expressions of the international struggle against the capitalist system against the exploitation that we all suffer under. And the role of revolutionaries is to bring all those partial struggles into one. And that's why we need one world party. 
Now, I've dealt a lot with a lot of the history of the revolutionary movement. There's more I could have said. I have skipped over a few notes. But the, the reason I've done that is because the revolutionary party is the memory of the working class. Uh, it remembers how, what revolu the lessons from revolutionary situations that have come before, how revolutionary organizations have been built, how they've been undermined, what we can learn from that. And we, can, we are in a better position than any organization before to learn those. That's because we have 160 years of history, which Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky themselves never had. We can learn the lessons from them, and we can incorporate it into the building of our revolutionary party today. The first organized socialist political party in Britain was the Social Democratic Federation, and it pop popularized this slogan, educate, agitate, organize. And that, in a nutshell, is how you build a revolutionary party. We have to educate ourselves about capitalism and socialism, reformism and revolution, so that we can argue our position for the seizure of power by the working class with no compromises and no half measures. That education is how we build cadres, which is the bedrock of a revolutionary party. Then we have to learn to agitate. Quoting long passages from the Communist Manifesto is not enough. We're not academics. We need a program that can connect those ideas to the living struggle of the working class. We can't afford to be cut off from the masses, shouting from the sidelines, or talking amongst ourselves. And we have to organize ourselves by welding together a revolutionary party composed of the most advanced elements of the class struggle across the world, above all the youth, I would say, young people in particular. And that involves practical tasks, self-discipline, and, uh, and self-sacrifice. So educate, agitate, organize. That is how you build a revolutionary party. That's the party that we are building today. And it will be the midwife to the new world which is struggling to be born. There is nothing that you can do more important than that.